But uh, to, to tell you a little bit more about myself and about Save One, and to, to so you kind of get a feel for what why I have this passion and why we do what we do, is we uh, like I told you before, we are a nonprofit organization and we do abortion recovery. And the passion for this subject comes from my own abortion that I had on March 29, 1985. And from that pain of the abortion, I spent seven years after that just just being obsessed with death, pretty much. I wanted to die because I, I couldn't figure out how to make myself right again. And so, and a lot of times, that's what we find with men and women, is you just feel hopeless because you can't fix this problem. Usually a problem that you have, you know how to fix it. You can go get an attorney or you can go back to and apologize to whoever it was that you offended or you can reason out and figure a way out of your problem but this one you can't because it's too late and so I spent this next seven years just taking massive amounts of drugs and and drinking enormous amounts of alcohol I became very promiscuous and just didn't care about anything I attempted suicide during the seven years and it, it was like my life just kept getting more and more hopeless yeah if you guys want to shut that door that'd be good it just became it just kept getting more and more hopeless until one day i heard a radio commercial from a pregnancy center i was in chattanooga tennessee and i heard a commercial on the radio and the way i remember it is like angels were singing and a light was shining on my car and it was like a discovery that I could not imagine. And they were just simply advertising a class they were having for women who had had an abortion and were suffering afterward. And if you've ever been in that position, you, you believe the enemy's lies and you think, I'm the only one who is suffering because the world tells you that this was a good choice right. for you. But I knew what was going on inside my heart and my mind was not computing with all the messages that I was hearing from the world. And so I felt like I was crazy. So to hear that these people actually formed a class and there may be more than just me who is suffering, it was a tremendous discovery. And so through a long story and series of events, I finally made my way to this class in 1992. My abortion was in 85. I found my way to this class in 92. And it was like these women gave me back my life on a silver platter. It was like they, it wasn't anything magical they did. It was like they took my hand and they loved me right where I was. They didn't judge me. They didn't tell me how horrible I was. I had been doing a good job of that for seven years. But they took my hand and they connected me back to Jesus. And that's all they did. It was like they just, they were the bridge that connected me again. And through that connection, I think somebody's coming in. And through that connection, I was able to find forgiveness and mercy and grace over the sin of my abortion. And it was so wonderful. I could not believe it. My marriage started being healed. I started being okay with my kids. I already had two little children by then. And I, I started being okay, like it's okay that I mother these children. They're not going to be taken away from me. That's not how God works. And so it, it, it just, every facet of my life started to heal. And I loved being in that feeling and in that mode so much. I immediately, the first thing I did was I signed up at that pregnancy center to help and volunteer. And so I started volunteering there. Before long, I took their training to teach their abortion recovery. I started teaching their abortion recovery classes, and I was loving it. It was great. And then all of a sudden, the company that my husband was working for said, we're getting transferred to Nashville. And so I was like, okay, you know, I've, I've done this for two years. My time in the pro-life movement is over. We're going to go. <laughs> we're going to... <laughs> you know how like she was talking about you make all your plans and then yeah. you have done something else but well, well, I thought we'll move to Nashville we'll make all these new friends nobody has to know about the drug addict Sheila and the drunk Sheila and you know we've got these two little boys we're this perfect little family and that's what I want to tell everybody and so we went to Nashville got involved in a really big church and I started being so convicted that I knew how to teach this Bible study that I knew was the key to freedom to, for so many people 
and I was just sitting there, not doing anything. And I, I began to be convicted, and I was like, I mean, to the point where I was having nightmares of standing at a podium in rooms filled with people, and I was telling them all that I had had an abortion. <laughs> I was having nightmares like that, and I would wake up in a cold sweat because I was fine in the in the confines of the little classroom where everybody else in there had had an abortion too, and I had been healed, and I could share this healing with them. But to think of going out in public and telling this story, uh, uh, you know, that's no way. I'm not doing that. But finally, God got his way, and he took me, and I had to go to the, the head pastor, the lead pastor, and I talked to him, a very charismatic, very intimidating man, and I had to tell him that I had had an abortion and that I, uh, uh, pretty much what I said was, you don't really want me to teach this Bible study, do you? <laughs> and he said, yes, I want you to teach it. I've been praying for somebody to do something about abortion here at the church. And so I was like, okay. And so I, I offered the class. We offered it. He spoke about it from the pulpit, which I think made all the difference in the world. Because when the pastor speaks of it from the pulpit, that's what draws people in. It's like he gives them permission mm -hmm. to come and deal with these very relevant problems that we're, we, ha we have to hide. And so I, we offered it, and ten women came. On that very first night, the first woman said, if I could just save one unborn baby, I'd be willing to tell my story. And when she said that, I realized all those classes that I taught in Chattanooga, I had heard them say the same thing. And so I was like, what is it about that phrase God wants me to do something with? And then he started taking me through the process, and it was like he showed me these women need a platform to tell their stories mm -hmm. because the public is not hearing these stories, right. that these women are left in a horrible position it, with lives that are devastated, marriages that are wrecked, sometimes fertility completely taken away from them, any hopes of a future, all of this is happening on our watches. And so when I started realizing, okay, and I went back to these women that were in this first class that I taught at the big church, there were 10 women who came and they were all like, well, the name needs to be Save One because that's, you know, that's, what, that's what you're doing is, is making a platform for these women to tell their stories. And so when men started asking to go through the women's class and then grandparents started asking to go through the class, that's when I woke up and thought, okay, this is much larger than a woman's issue. We can no longer say this is just about women. It is just as much about men as it is women. It's just as much about the families who suffer around that one abortion. So to, I, that gives you a little bit about the, the, uh, the history of us. And I told you about the three different Bible studies. As we started uncovering all these people who were hurting, I started writing more Bible studies and they all mirror each other. I think I said that earlier. So you don't have to hold like three separate groups, one for men, one for women, and one for families. You can put them all together and they heal together and it's beautiful. I'm going to tell you a story at the end that just shows you how incredible. But uh, a lot of times when, or, or let me tell you this, since I started St. One in 2000, I literally thought it was just going to be a little Bible study. I taught at my church. It has now grown to, we have over 200 chapters of St. One in 21 different countries around the world. That first book that I wrote, The Women's Study, has now been translated into 15 different languages. I mean, I'm like, I'm kind of like what Georgette was saying. If she had known all that God had in store, if, if he showed me the big picture back then, I probably would have gone running and screaming in the opposite direction. But he kind of takes you through a process and helps you grow into it as you go along. But so many times when abortion recovery is mentioned, people think, well, it's too late for them. Why are we going to put a bunch of money into that when they've already made that choice? The baby's already lost. And so they put abortion recovery down at the bottom of the budget. If you're, if you're at a pregnancy center, it's like, well, if we have some money left over, we'll do abortion recovery. And I get that because in your, in your mind you think, well, it's too late for them. We want to stop people from, ha from choosing abortion, men and women. We want to stop them, so, but it's too late for them. So we're going to put all our money over here into, into stopping people from making the choice. 
where at Save One, we believe this is the greatest resource we have, are these people who have made this choice, turning their life around and getting them over here on our side. Because until they're healed, they're just sitting in our churches, they're checking us out at the grocery stores. They're fixing our cars at the mechanic shop. I mean, they're, and they're just wondering, like, how am I ever going to be healed from this? Like I was explaining, I was just hopeless. I, hadn't, I, I didn't know who I could turn to. I didn't know who was a safe place. But the minute I heard, oh, my gosh, they're offering something that is exactly what my problem is, I was there. And I became their most, <laughs> most staunch advocate loyal ally that that pregnancy center could have had because I was so thankful that they gave me a safe place to heal. Still today, that pregnancy center is one of our Safe One chapters. I love it. So anyway, but through this workshop, if you're one of those who has never seen how abortion recovery goes hand in hand with our pro-life efforts, I hope that through this workshop, over the next few minutes, your mind will open and you'll walk out that door with a whole new way of thinking about abortion recovery, okay? So, uh, through my time teaching, teaching the, the abortion recovery, Save One was born, and that's when I started writing the books. And I started realizing that not only women suffer afterward, but when we started having men asked to go through the women's class, and then we started having grandparents, I knew God was truly up to something, showing me the bigger picture of who all really is involved in this abortion and it's not just the woman. I feel like the pro-abortion side made us believe that it's all about women because it shuts everybody else out and it leaves this woman over here vulnerable making a choice she was never created to make. And so that was by design. But we are pulling everybody back in and <laughs> saying, no, this is a family crisis for our generation. When I started realizing that this is a man's issue too, we, we took down all our printed materials, we started looking at our website, we started looking at everything to make sure it was gender neutral and not all girly looking because we wanted to attract men just as much as we do women. And as a matter of fact, my husband just came on board full time as our men's director. Right. So I'm pretty pumped about that too. Uh, but if you would, on your sheet or wherever you're taking notes, Write up, make a list that says verse number one and verse number two. And then below that, put weapon number one and weapon number two. Okay? And these are in no order, like one, number one is more important than the other. These are just the two weapons and the two verses. And who has their Bible or can look up a scripture for me? Uh, in, in the uh, New King James Version. So. On your phone Amen. or whatever, Proverbs 18.21. Oh, okay. Who knows what that verse is? If you would read that for us, Proverbs 18, 21. You said you wanted New King James? Yes. Okay, Don't you love that we can do that? Like I can read it in three different, three different uh, versions, just like that. Okay. All right, here we go. All right. Uh, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Is it, think about that for a minute. The power of life and death are in our tongue. The words that we say are so important. The words that we say either speak death into a situation and give the enemy something to work with, or we speak life into a situation and give the angels something to work with. Because everything that we're, spe we're speaking is doing one or the other. We're speaking life or we're speaking death. That's the power of our tongue. So the number one po most powerful human weapon we wield is our tongue. We can choose to use our tongue for evil or for good, for life or for death. It's our choice. Our tongue is an extremely powerful weapon. And as a matter of fact, James 3 says it, it likens it to the small rudder that steers a massive ship. That's how powerful our tongue is. And then through abortion recovery, we're teaching people to say these words that bring life and not death. So our tongue is a very powerful weapon. And then who can look up this verse for me? Revelation 12, 11. Again, in the New King James Version. You want to look that up for us? Is it Jeff? Okay. Revelation 12, 11. Revelation 12, 11. In the New King James Version. 
And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. That's an incredible scripture. And that's the one that all the bells and whistles went off in my mind and, and, and as far as abortion recovery goes. Him in that scripture is the enemy. We overcome him. We overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. How incredible is that? The, uh, the enemy, him, has had the abortion issue locked up in his crib for 46 years now. It's his playground. It's, it's everything he lives for, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. It's the pro-abortion mantra. They steal, they kill, and they destroy. It's everything that the enemy was sent here to do is all wrapped up in the abortion issue and in the abortion industry. So when we start speaking the life-giving words with our tongue and we're covered with the blood of the Lamb, which if you're a child of God, you're covered with the, by the blood of the Lamb, you have that protection, and you start speaking these words out, telling this is what abortion really did to me, but this is how God healed me and forgave me, we become more powerful than the enemy. We overcome the abortion issue when we do that. That, to me, is so exciting. It's not hopeless anymore. I have power, and it's given to me by God. And all I have to do is just start speaking out what He's done for me. And we overcome Him immediately by the blood of the Lamb, which we're covered with, and the word of our testimony. But we cannot speak that testimony until we're healed. And that's where abortion recovery comes in. So we go and we find these people who need help and hope and healing after abortion, which they're all in our churches, all in our churches. It's one out of every three women, which means it's one out of every three men of childbearing age have suffered the loss of a child through abortion. And so when you think about how big your church is, you could, you could offer abortion recovery for years just in your church and get everybody healed. And you're, you're adding to this army of truth tellers who are no longer willing to be silent. Because when you get these people healed, the, the two things happen. One, they never choose abortion again. So you're ending that cycle of death in their life and in their family. Multiple abortions are very common. And so when you end that cycle of death in their family, they are like they never choose abortion again, but then they also turn around, they raise their children to sanctify life. They speak openly about it in their families. They find themselves, and I tell people all the time, some of the greatest greatest um, ministry that we do is sitting in a room like this on break in a, at work. And, and the person who just went through the Save One class or your abortion recovery class will be sitting just having lunch. And it's amazing how God will steer to you the people who need to hear what He's done. And all of a sudden, the abortion issue comes up. And all of a sudden, that person who just graduated is telling the whole room that they had an abortion and this is what it really does to you. And then they walk out going, oh my gosh, I've never done that before in my life. But I was able to talk. I didn't have a big emotional reaction. I was able to tell what it was like to see my wife go through an abortion. Or I was able to tell what it was like to crawl up on that table myself. And they're able to, to sway everybody's opinions because nobody can argue with personal experience. It would be like you leaving here and saying, oh, I went to the summit for the Anglicans for Life, and somebody going, no, you didn't. I mean, that would be stupid. You know you were here. <laughs> you can't argue with your personal experience. And that's how it is with abortion recovery. It becomes the most powerful thing we can do is to start talking about what God has done in our life how He healed us from abortion. But people need that safe place to talk before they'll ever come out. One time I flew into China, and just to give you a quick example, I flew to China, and I was with this team of women. They had invited, we were having a women's conference over there, and each woman had a different subject, and you know, mine was abortion. And so we're all there, this team, and the missionary couple who were kind of taking us around, they came back on the bus and they said, hey, so-and-so wants to sit with you on the bus that was taking us to our hotel. I mean, we had just landed and gotten in the bus together. And I said, oh, sure, okay. 
And so she came back and sat down first time I had ever met her. And she started confessing an abortion to me. She was one of the missionaries on the field in, in China, in Xi'an, China. And so I was just listening to her, you know. And I knew that they ran the language school. So all of the, the missionaries through the Assemblies of God came that went to China came through their school first. And so I said, you know what would really be great is if you started teaching as a small group the Save One Bible Study so you could get these missionaries healed so they're not taking this baggage out onto the mission field. And she said, oh, there isn't anybody who's ever had an abortion here. <laughs> And I was like, really? How do you know? Because I knew, you know. And she goes, because nobody's ever told me. And I said, well, how many people have you told? And she goes, nobody. <laughs> and then she looked at me, and I just sat there looking at her. And it was like, the light bulb went off. Like, oh, yeah. And I said, I was the safe place for you to talk. That's why you felt like you could come back here and talk to me, even though we've never laid eyes on each other in our life. But all of a sudden, I was safe because you knew I had been there. And she was like, oh my gosh. It, it was like it just hit her that, that how many people are walking around wounded and, and aren't talking about this. And they're taking all of this out onto the mission field with them. How many people are in our churches just like that who aren't being the, the parents that they could be, the leaders in the churches that we need, the volunteers at our pregnancy centers, how many people are out there that we could could bring around us and unite and be more powerful because their voices are headed to what we're doing. So, like I said, nobody can argue with another person's personal experience. Who better to talk to men and women in unplanned pregnancies than those who have been there and chose death instead of life to tell them this is really what's about to happen to you. This isn't a simple procedure like getting your tonsils out, like what they want you to believe. This is a life and death issue. You are about to walk into mothering or, fa or being the father of a dead child, not one that doesn't exist anymore. And so you're able to tell them the truth of what abortion really does. And what does the truth do for us? It sets us free. That's right. So abortion recovery, when we bring <coughs> abortion recovery up to the level of all of the pro-life efforts, I would love to know, that whole room up there, there's no telling the kind of ministry we are all doing. I would love to know what every single person is doing in the pro-life movement, in the Christian, in the kingdom, building God's kingdom, and, and you going through the abortion issue. I would love to know what everybody does because I think if everybody brought abortion recovery up to making it as, as important as everything else that we're doing, we could not only double but triple and even quadruple the amount of people that are involved in what we're doing. Excited, passionate, loyal, because when you, when you bring these people in, they become donors. They become volunteers, they become voices, advocates, and allies for you because they feel so grateful that you offered them a place. We've seen all that happen in our church. Multiple times. When we had the church. Multiple times. And when you think about it, all of us are in this room because Georgette went out and spoke life-giving words. She was covered by the blood of the Lamb. And when she started speaking her testimony, it overcame the enemy in other people's lives. She started this organization, Silent No More, and, and here we all are because she was healed. What if she had never been healed? We wouldn't all be here right now in this room together. We may be doing other things scattered around, but we wouldn't all be collective here. But it was because Georgette got healed. And so it just keeps on snowballing and snowballing. So what are the two scriptures we must commit to memory? What are they? Proverbs 18, 21, 21 and, and Revelation 12, 11. Right. And what are our two greatest human weapons we wield? The tongue. The tongue. And our testimony. testimony. That's right. Because when we have God on our side, when we are covered by the blood of the Lamb, we become a powerful tool in the hands of a powerful God. And it's amazing to see. So the men, women, and families in our communities who have these testimonies 
have to be healed before they can go do those testimonies. And I'm not saying like, oh, you have to go through stage one to be healed. <laughs> no. God can deliver in a moment. And I've seen it. And seen people get up from an altar and they're completely fine because they laid it all down and they're ready to go. So don't put God in a box and say, oh, you've got to go through our 12-week Bible study. You know, it's always good to be familiar with the, with the content, but God can do anything. Mm -hmm. So... I know it's an audacious claim to think this is the key to ending abortion in our country and around our world, but I feel like God has mapped it out for us in Scripture, that this is how we co overcome the enemy. And the enemy is all wrapped up in the abortion issue. And to make audacious claims, I know we serve an audacious God that responds to our audacious faith. And when we enact that faith, He does miraculous things. And it's not anything miraculous we do at Save One. God knows we are extremely limited. But when we engage in the Holy Spirit power and Jesus comes down and heals these people, it's absolutely amazing. And when I go around and teach trainings and teach chapters how to, how to teach our curriculum, I tell people all the time that seat that you sit in is addictive because you get to see God's miracles take place you're on the front row and sometimes people will come into a classroom like this and they can't even stop crying because they're they just walking through the threshold or over the threshold they're admitting, admitting for the first time that they've had an abortion and so you get to see them come in so broken but then leave after three and four and five weeks and they're smiling they're being more open they're talking and they're getting healed. And then at the end of the 10 or 12 week study, they're amazing. And they don't care who knows that they had an abortion because they're ready to tell the world. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool to see all of that. So uh, I wanted to tell you, I told you I was going to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story that just how powerful this is, okay? I remember I told you guys that when men started asking to go through the women's class was when I wrote the men's study. Well, that very first night, when I started Save One, I promised God, whoever you put in my path, I'll help them. If, there, if any way possible, I'll do it. And so, but I was just focused on women. I just thought, you know what, women, this is a woman's issue, and we were just focused on women. And so that night at my church, a man walked up. His name's Timothy. He don't mind me telling. He's on our staff now. But he, he walked up to me, and he asked if he could take the women's class. We were starting to get so many women through this class that they were out in the church telling people and the stigma of talking about abortion in the church was breaking down. And it was beautiful to see. So he had heard and seen the healing that all these women were going through and he wanted it. And so he asked if he could go through the women's class. And so I said, sure. I was, and I hate to admit that now, but it was literally the first time I had ever thought that a man might suffer after an abortion and so I said sure come on you know because I knew what I had promised God that I would help whoever he put in my path and so he came to the class he brought his wife who was not a part of his abortion experience I had eight other women in that class and those eight women I had to call them and say hey we have a man that's coming to the class are you okay with that and I was just I was a little leery of it they were a little leery of it but I didn't know what else to do I had no idea yeah. but I was like I'm not going to tell him no I'm not going to help you so he came in he and his wife came to the class every single week it was absolutely beautiful absolutely loved it they the women's hearts were tendered toward men seeing how he suffered his heart was tendered toward women seeing how they suffered and it was like they all healed together his wife's eyes were completely open she admitted at the end of the class that she had always judged women mm -hmm. who had had abortions and had no idea all that had happened so anyway absolutely beautiful i thought yeah, that was fluke you know one man <laughs> and so the very next class I offered, another man asked to go through the women's study. So that's when I woke up and I was like, okay, it's time to write the men's book. But Timothy, from the first class, about a year later got transferred to a little European country we've heard a lot about <coughs> lately called Slovenia, where our first lady's from. And so she, he, they got transferred over to Slovenia. So we said bye. I thought, I'm never going to see them again. <laughs> 
And so they went to Slovenia, and they were there over about a year, he and his wife, who had gone through the class. And Timothy called one day, and he said, the need is great. He said, they're literally killing themselves off. Their, their, their population rate is going down because the abortion rate is so high. And so he said, do we have permission to take the women's book, translate it into Slovene, and register as an NGO in Europe? And I said, well, uh, yeah, let me think about that for a second. <laughs> and so he did just that. He and his wife did that, started chapters up and down Slovenia. It was absolutely beautiful. He started traveling around Europe, starting chapters. And that was not even his job. He had another great job in Slovenia, but he was doing this part time, he and his wife. Along his travels, he met a woman named Sonia Horswell who lives in Vienna, Austria. She was on fire, was running the pro-life movement for Austria. So they decided to have a Save One conference in 08 and invited me over to speak. And so I was like, okay, we're gonna have our first international Save One conference. So we went over, me and another girl, went over to Vienna, Austria, had this conference, fell in love with Sonia and her husband, Chris. And so she and I stayed in touch, and you know she was just doing great, being a, a Save One chapter leader. So then a little while later, maybe a year or two later, Timothy and Christy got transferred to China. So they were leaving Slovenia, got transferred to China. And so he was like, well, I want to hand over the reins to Sonia Horswell of Save One Europe, because now we were calling it Save One Europe because we had so many chapters in Europe. And so I said, that's a great idea. I love her. Let's do it. And so she and her husband, her husband has now retired and joined her at Save One Europe, and they're traveling all over Europe. They've started all kinds of chapters in Austria, in Germany, Switzerland, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, Sarajevo, Hungary, uh, I don't know where else. She travels all the time with Save One Europe, starting chapters, helping people recover after abortion. You don't grow to this size if there's not a need. There is a great need out there. And so she's rocking and rolling across Europe while Timothy and Christy go to China with the intent this time, we're going to get Save One started in China. So they did start to Save One China, raised up a leader, got the women's uh, curriculum translated into Mandarin. It's a beautiful book. Then they got transferred back to Michigan. <laughs> so now we have three chapters of Save One in China. They're living in Michigan. As soon as they got back to Michigan, I was like, please come on staff and be our international liaisons and take care of all our international chapters. And it was a no-brainer. They said yes. So Timothy and Christy Hall are back here now, and they're on staff and still operating Save One out of their church now in Michigan. So I tell you all that to say that's one testimony. He went to Slovenia and started speaking life-giving words he overcame the enemy in so many lives in Europe because he was willing to speak those life-giving words and, and he was covered by the blood of the Lamb and he overcame the enemy just by speaking his testimony. And still, he's even back in the States now. And still, he, the, we, the, his work, what he got started, is still going on in China and in all across Europe. So it's one testimony. Think if we raised an army of Timothys, an army of Georgettes, an army of truth-tellers who are no longer willing to be silent, but are ready to go tell people what this, this really does to you, what abortion really does to you. That's what we need, and that's why I feel like this is the key to ending abortion. We can no longer just wait on a politician to do it for us, because we've had the right guy elected, right woman elected, I don't know how many times, and we still, 46 years later, we still have abortion legalized in this country. So it's time we do something different. It's time we, we attack this from a different radical approach, and I think it's abortion recovery. So I, I want to give you time. We have about 10 minutes, 11 minutes. So if, if we want to have discussion, because I want to learn from you guys too, or questions. Yes? Um, how, for those of us that haven't had an abortion, but have a heart for this, and know people mm -hmm. that have, mm -hmm. um, how can we help them 
feel comfortable, or maybe it's just we have them find mm -hmm. a save one chapter or something. Like, yes. what can we do to get people sharing their testimonies or help them recover? Mm -hmm. um, well, a lot of times I hear people say, yeah, "Well, if you've never had an abortion, you really can't help someone who's who's been who needs that help." And that is simply not true. Mm -hmm. Sonia and Chris Horswell, neither one have ever experienced abortion. But their heart and their genuineness and their authenticity comes out. And people see that you're not here to judge me. You're here to love me. And I think that's the key is just saying, you know what, I, I have a heart for this. Because you're not naturally drawn to this issue. You don't just wake up one day and think, I really want to get involved in that abortion <laughs> issue. You know? It's a God call. God call. Yeah. It is. And so when it gets in you, you, once you've seen it, you can't look away. Yes. And so you're in it for a reason. There's a reason that God has you here. And if your interest is being drawn to abortion recovery, there's a reason. And when you just open up your heart and say, that I want to help you or you know whatever it is, People know. They can spot a fake a mile away. When you're genuine and authentic, they know. So your is your program something that someone who hasn't experienced it could lead? Absolutely. Okay. We have chapter leaders all across America who uh, not everybody has had an abortion. We even have staff members who haven't had an abortion. It's not a requirement at all. One of the things that we encourage people to do if they haven't had that in their past is to just, if you want to approach a friend and you know and it's that awkward thing, is just say, I heard this lady speak the other day right. on this, and just tell a little bit of her testimony because her te testimony is still powerful in, yeah. in those hands. So mm -hmm. it, it's a, it's, it opens the narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I yes. was just going to add, I, I'm post abortive as well and mm -hmm. carried it for 20 years before wow. mm -hmm. I got into my healing. Um, process with Rachel's Vineyard and <clears throat> I think there's two things in response to your question we have to quit saying abortion with this cringing thing mm -hmm. we have to be willing to speak it and whether it's those of us who've gone through it or people like you or your friend who maybe has a heart for it the other thing that we have to do is I believe is make it clear to people that this is not a political issue. Exactly. It has nothing to do with politics. That's right. It has to yeah. do with me and my creator. That's right. And and I think when we when we begin to speak abortion, immediately people's heads go to oh politics, mm -hmm. politics. And right. it's, it's really not. Mm -hmm. um, and and then I guess there's a lot of things. A third thing <laughs> speak it from Speak it from the pulpit. Speak it in the church. Yes. Yeah. yes. You know, I, it makes I'm all the difference priest, in the world. And I'm going to say that in my diocese, there are, and I would say this in front of my bishop, there are a whole lot of people, a whole lot of priests who would not speak this in their church mm -hmm. um, because there's just this shame about it. Mm -hmm. I stand up and speak it when I preach, and I'll be preaching this weekend, and I'll be preaching about this because it's for Life Sunday. That's great. Um, but we just have to be able to speak it mm -hmm. more yeah. and use the word abortion. Mm -hmm. Well, I saw that very thing in our church mm -hmm. when yeah. the more people started talking about it, the yes. more the stigma broke down yes. and Absolutely. the more it opened up for other healing avenue, that avenues, for sexual trauma, yes. for divorce recovery. Yes. For It was like all of these groups started yes. because people started realizing, oh, I can go to that I church and deal with yes. relevant problems. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, I just wanted to say that um, I went back to school in... Uh, in my 50s to become a counselor and I, I really feel I too I don't thank you for asking that question because um, the Lord has for a long time put this on my heart and mm -hmm. I have not experienced abortion but I know he's calling me to it I know yes. he is and so in my in my work as a therapist more and more people now that my colleagues are starting to um, you know refer women to me and so forth and but I um, I'm thinking two things. One is I agree with what you were saying about this is the key, I think, to changing mm -hmm. our culture is mm -hmm. that women and men begin to speak. And um, this, so I, I've always thought that. I'm like, yes, that's what I think. Yeah, good. Um, 
And also, uh, I'm glad that you asked that question because I, my client, I have a new client who who is supposed to afford, has had an abortion, and she for the first, she's the first one who's ever said to me, "Have you had an abortion?" Mm. And I told her I was honest with her mm -hmm. because I was speaking so passionately that I think she assumed mm -hmm. because my heart was so. She said, "Can I ask you a question?" You know, and I don't mean to be nosy. And I said, "No, that's fine." You, I said, "But the Lord really has called me to this, mm -hmm. and that He's put it in my heart. I didn't pick this. I know He yeah. me to do this." So I'm thinking of even like specializing and, and starting to have a group That's maybe great. using your materials. That's or, correct. Right now I use a book, um, uh, a Season to Heal. Like mm -hmm. That book, are you familiar with that book? Yes. And uh, I, who wrote that? Uh, is it Lucy Free? Yes. Yes. Yeah. To, because From it, Nashville. Even though she's a Christian, I don't even really know, but I mean, <laughs> sometimes when, if I'm not sure spiritually where somebody is, all they that that's a good opener, mm -hmm. and then I use the more uh, Bible study. But I'm yeah. going to look. I would like to get your materials. Oh, absolutely, you know? they're out there. And the other thing is, I don't know that there's a training for counselors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not that it should be anything different than what we do in the pregnancy centers. It's the same mm -hmm. ministry, but. Yeah, like my colleagues are not. Com I mean, it's not that they're not comfortable. They all like they refer them to me, and I'm like, mm -hmm. you guys, this is she something we should all do. Teresa Burke. Oh yes, I have. Yeah. Well, uh, that, and her book, uh, Forbidden Grief. Forbidden that's Grief. an incredible Forbidden book. Yeah. I love Teresa I and that. Kevin. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, and it's not all just about save one. There's only a handful of abortion recovery curriculums out there. Yeah. We need. 20 yeah. more yeah. to reach the 60 million women yeah. and the 60 million men. I mean, it's like, I just want everybody doing abortion recovery. Right. I don't mm -hmm. care what curriculum you use as long as it's based on God's Word. Right. You know? Right. So, uh, but I, of course, I think hers is the best. No, but, I don't check yours out. I don't know how yours yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, but there was something else I was about to say, too. Oh, oh, oh training. I, I do trainings all the time. That's oh, one of my favorite things that I do, is I spend an all-day Saturday with Pregnancy Resource Center staffs or church staffs or their leaders, whoever it is that wants to be involved with abortion recovery, we come in to your place and teach the training. We only charge yeah. travel expenses for that and $20 per person. And they go home with a book and a, tra a training packet. Uh, but then also we have a high gig flash drive and we've got it for sale up on our table that's a condensed version of our training. And it's me just like talking, doing training videos but then after each one, we have a different one of our chapter leaders and how they implement what I've just trained on, how they implement it in their chapter. Plus, it's got our chapter, um, our leader's manual on it, on that flash drive. Well, so there's a lot of that. Talk I have some lots of colleagues. I mean, oh, sure. I think That'd that if they trained, they feel more. Yes. Yes. Okay, you and then you. Okay. And then I think yeah, we just got like three more between a chapter and having a Bible study. So this it's is the same. Keeps going. It's oh, the same thing. It's chapter keep meeting yes. even after. Well, we'll what, Bible study it or? depends on your location. A lot of times people will have reunions afterward, mm -hmm. but it's literally we train two separate ways. One is our traditional 10 to 12 week Bible study, mm -hmm. and that's that tends to work at a lot of churches because a lot of them will work on a quarter program. Uh, so you can run it as a small group like that, or uh, you can, uh, we also train on a weekend plus six, and that's like a Friday night, all day Saturday, and then just six weeks after that. More men like that, because it's quick, and they're, they're not thinking, i got to spend three months talking about the abortion. Mm -hmm. that. Uh, but I, I, I like the traditional way better, but a lot of people like the the weekend plus six. So those are the two different ways. But if we, sometimes I say Bible study, sometimes I say a chapter. A chapter is just someone who teaches our Bible study. But there's benefits to being a chapter with us. Yes. It doesn't cost anything, but... They, but you get a free web page on our website. We have chapter coordinators over every state, and so if you have a question, you know who to reach at the same one office, and, and I mean, you've got constant contact with them. If somebody's looking for, your, for help in that area, they click on... Um, they can, on the yeah, website, like, they can find help and they, they can see your chapter in that area. And, and click on your name and email you immediately, totally bypassing our office. So it's not like a referral program or anything like that. They can just get straight to you in their local help.
And then, yes, you had a question. Um, I just wondered if you ever had any abortion workers come to you who have regretted I being have not field. yet. Mm. That, that have come out of the abortion mm. industry? And I, I have, have not cousin personally. I, I don't know how to speak to her, but I can see that there are issues in her life that I'm sure are connected with the fact that she worked with an abortion. Absolutely. Oh, if she's true. never had an abortion, the ripple effect would be yes. for her. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. it's kind of, it's the peripheral people yeah. around. I see more of a change in her since she's had a child. Wow. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. Do you, when you run your groups, do you run them co-ed? Mm -hmm. Or do you? Yes, I do. So a lot of people. That's it. Yeah, I know. A lot of people are like, "Oh my gosh, you can't do that!" Mind. Like my friends that have all their initials after their names, they were like, "You can't do that!" And I was like, "Really? I didn't know." And and but I'm so glad yes. I didn't know because I had to rely completely on the Holy Spirit. And now I wouldn't have it any other way. And now they're all like saying, "It's yeah. a good thing." that the men and women are together. Right. <laughs> I'm not taking credit for it, but I mean, it, yeah. it's absolutely beautiful yeah. when, when you have the men and women in together. Yes? Ken, you may not have time to really address this, but <laughs> what I'm thinking about is a lot of what you're saying is um, speaking to people who are in the church or who have um, some kind of cognitive awareness that what they're experiencing is related to that, you know, guilt mm -hmm. or, and, um, but we're living in a culture where there's a total disconnect, mm -hmm. where this is seen as something good. Um, you know, women are even saying, I'm not only pro-choice, but I'm pro-abortion. It's like, really? Mm -hmm. and, and yet, because they're living out the reality of life, I'm sure many, many of them are experiencing this. And I'm just wondering, um, do they connect it to that? And how do you speak into that group yeah. of people who are not in the church and not embracing a belief system in any way? Their, their belief system is abortion is a, is a good thing. It's, yeah. you know, it allows me to have autonomy over my body yeah. and things like that. Do, can you just well, say something about two things? One is just because you don't believe God's word doesn't make it not true. And so right. when when these women are saying and men are saying abortion is good and I'm pro abortion and all that, you can't go against God's word mm -hmm. in such a a horrible fashion and not suffer some type of consequences. Right. So I know behind closed doors what they're going through. Mm -hmm. Unless their conscience is just completely seared and they have become amoral, mm -hmm. they, they have to, when they lay down at night, I know that it's bothering them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I can't be the Holy Spirit in their life. Mm -hmm. And so when they're ready to come to me, I'm here. I, I don't ever try to talk, and I'm not saying this is what you're talking about, but I don't ever try to talk someone into coming to my class. Right. If they right. say, I don't need it, I'm thankful that's I had an abortion at 14, mm -hmm. I would not have gotten it. I'm like, that's great. It doesn't affect you like it has a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I just leave it like that. And I just pray that like when she's ready or when he's ready, they'll come. Mm -hmm. And, and so, I, the, but the more you're out there, the more you're talking, they want you to go away. Because you're you're exposing yeah. them, uh -huh. you're you're saying this is a really uh -huh. bad thing <laughs> that we did, and you can be healed from it. And that if they admit, they have to admit that it was wrong mm -hmm. to be healed. And so they don't want to admit that it was wrong because then they've got to face it. So you're really talking about being in a context where they're hearing you talk in some way mm -hmm. about this. Yes, that you're out. Uh -huh. Yes. We have a chapter that's in Nashville or just outside of Nashville, and I don't know if you guys have them here, but on Facebook there's the HIP and then whatever the, the area is. There's HIP Hendersonville, HIP Nashville, HIP Antioch, HIP Goodwoodsville, yeah. HIP White House. It's just a page on and there. And people just and, talk about what's happening in their yeah, community. And, and the, the responses on there are just vile sometimes when you're trying to throw something out that's mm -hmm. decent. But one of the chapters up there, posted that they were having a class. A save one class. A save one class. Mm -hmm. And how many? Four out of the there six came four, from the community. Yeah, came from the that community. That were not a part of the church at all. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there are people mm -hmm. out there looking and watching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're done. Yeah. It's a, we're Thank way so over. Much. Thank you for being here. Okay, good. I hope training. I training. Awesome.